Um, I want to read from you to you from uh, John, the 20th chapter, and then we'll go to Luke 20. Jesus said, and this is the text we'd been using last year, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Again, let's read verses 21 and 22 aloud together to be on your screen. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Father, again, help us to hear your voice today through me and in many ways, Lord, in spite of me. Let your people hear your voice, I ask, in Jesus' precious name, and amen. We have been talking about ministering with the Lord, and the ministry that you and I are allowed to engage in is the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his work. It all belongs to him. The kingdom is his kingdom. The service is his service. The ministry is his ministry. The church is his church. And all that we do and all that we endeavor to do isn't, isn't to build our spiritual resume, but rather to extend his kingdom, to extend his resume, his glory. The idea of the glory of the Lord isn't just the shininess that we think of when we think of Shekinah or Shekinah. It's the idea of the fame of the Lord, uh, that the name of the Lord is spread, that the fame of the Lord is extended. So we exist to do his ministry in his love uh, and, and, and for his glory and by his power. These are all the things that we've been, we've been talking about. And my intention this morning was to come to you and, and, and finish laying out mission. And, um, and by God's will and God's grace, we'll do that next Sunday. Um, but, but I'm actually going to go to a passage that you'll hear again. Uh, you'll hear again because it's, it's so important uh, to, to this whole endeavor. In the 20th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, the 18th verse, Jesus is speaking. And he's speaking to the people, and, and, and he's kind of rebuking them. And, um, and, and in fact, the, the Bible tells us, Luke tells us later, that the teachers of the law and the Pharisees knew that Jesus had spoken against them. And, and it, it made them angry, and they were, uh, they were looking for ways to arrest him, but didn't at that time. These are the words of Christ. He says, everyone who falls on that stone, the stone the builders rejected, the capstone, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. I believe this is a principle of ministry. I believe that the Lord calls us to stand on the rock, of course, but he also calls us to fall upon it. He calls us to come to a place of brokenness in our life and brokenness in our experience, brokenness in our sense of, of, of awareness that the ministry and the work all belongs to the Lord. There's a great tragedy taking place right now in that we are doing a whole lot of ministry, particularly in, in, in Western Europe and North America, in the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're doing a whole lot of ministry without the Holy Spirit. We're doing a whole lot of stuff. We're busy. We sing well. We play well. Sometimes we preach well. We, we, we do all sorts of things. But Warren Wearsby's quote from about 30 years ago echoes in my mind right now. And Warren Wearsby said, if the Holy Spirit were taken out of the evangelical church today, no one would know the difference. Now, don't get me wrong. People are getting saved. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. 
People are being comforted. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not, I'm not implying that, that, that the Lord isn't active. He's, he's active, but I think he's active in a lot of ways in spite of us. Not because we're conduits of grace and mercy. And there's going to come a point in time where we either fall on him and walk in brokenness. Or there's a crushing that has to take place. Humility is of such importance to the kingdom of God. That no ministry flows without it. Humility is the great barrier or the great protector against all of the other carnality that flows out of my life naturally. I am, more than any of you, the most wicked guy I personally know. I'm the most prideful guy I know, I'm the most arrogant guy I know, and I'm the, I, I'm the most wicked guy I know. And the reason for that is I'm the only guy I actually know. And even that's blind, got blind spots. Okay? But it's this principle that I want us to consider for a couple minutes today. Well, maybe about 25 minutes today, as I'm looking at the clock. And I want you to look at the life of the Apostle Paul with me. So this next passage isn't going to be on your screen because I didn't send it to Reverend Fears to get to Tina <laughs> or whoever's up there. I can't quite see. But... <laughs> But I want you to look at Acts, the ninth chapter with me now. Okay? And so you actually have to use a Bible. What a concept. But I want you to go with me to Acts chapter 9. Now, Acts chapter 9 follows an incredible event that took place in chapter 7, where that, that the, the, a man named Saul was giving approval to the martyrdom of a man named Stephen. And he was standing there giving approval to the death of Stephen. Stephen, one of the first martyrs in the church. And Stephen was stoned to death. Now, I want you to kind of imagine, if you will, for a moment, the brutality of such a killing. Where people take rocks and throw them at a person until first he's wounded, then he's incapacitated, and finally he's broken and crushed and killed. It's horrible. And Stephen had testified that as he was dying, that he looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of, uh, of God. And the Bible says in chapter 8, verse 1, that Saul was there giving approval to his death. Then Luke records for us in chapter 8 that great persecution uh, was unleashed against the church of Jesus Christ. But through that persecution, the gospel spread. And then gives two examples of the spreading of the gospel. One being uh, Philip, the, the, the Ethiopian official who comes to the Lord. So then he comes back to chapter 9. And, and Luke's laying out a narrative for us. And then in chapter 9, verse 1, he says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Okay, he'd gotten a taste of blood and, and found that it, it got him some, some, some good notoriety, some good fame with the religious folks went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the, uh, to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground. Everybody say he fell to the ground. And he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. 
In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered. I heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Fall on the rock, be broken. The rock falls on you, be crushed. Either way, breaking's coming. The Lord will fulfill his purpose. In the stoning of Stephen was a witness and a testimony to this chief persecutor, Saul. So much so that when Saul sees a light and falls down and hears a voice, he asks the question, who are you? Because he doesn't know the Lord. Now remember, Saul was going to Damascus to do harm to Christians in the name of God. For the benefit of God. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Blinds him, takes him, led by the hand, this proud, brilliant, venomous man. Groping about like a child. Praying and fasting. The Lord sends a humble servant to him. To show him how much he must suffer. Ananias, verse 17, went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. And we kind of know the story from there. Okay. Everybody say this with me. Saul experienced crushing. All that he was got changed in a moment. All that he thought he was about, his mission, his vision, his purpose, his reason for existing, everything was going one direction and God intervened and crushed him. And the good news is that God can take dust and form life out of dust. And Saul would eventually become Paul. And the old man who was crushed would become a new man walking in the ways of God. Saul experienced crushing. If the rock falls on you, it will crush you. It will take what you were, what you thought you were, what you thought your future held, what you thought your purpose in life was. It will take all of that and grind it to powder. Don't you wish this was more like a kumbaya Sunday? <laughs> now, lest you think that's all we got to worry about, let's look at Paul for a minute. Go with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is the passage that we will come back to again this year. But I'm going to set the table with it even a little earlier than I anticipated doing. Paul, Saul, rather, is now Paul. Saul, the persecutor, is now Paul, the apostle. 
Saul, the venomous, murderous, threatening man, is now the guy who has written the love chapter that we all love so much. That every pagan quotes at their weddings, okay? This is who Saul is now. He has been transformed. He has been crushed. The crushed, broken man has become the beloved Apostle Paul. But he's dealing with a church he's planted, and he's dealing with the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church is very anointed. The Corinthian church has a great deal of spiritual gifts in it, but they don't have much character. They're quite Pentecostal, but they don't walk very much depth in the love of God and the ways of God. And Paul has spent an entire two letters trying to correct them. Some historians think maybe there was a third letter. I don't, I don't know. Okay, but, but we know that 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, he's trying to correct the Corinthian church. And he's trying to deal with them, and he puts beautiful framework in place. And, and, he's, and, he, and he refuses to boast. Because some of them in, in Corinth have actually questioned his position, his place, his right, his authority. All the stuff that usurpers do, all the stuff that the kingdom of darkness does. So he says, he says this in verse number 30 of 2 Corinthians 11. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Why? Paul learned a lesson here about crushing and breaking. If I must boast, I'll boast of things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the king, under King Aretas, had the city of the, Dama uh, of the Damascus guarded in order to arrest me, but I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. I must go on boasting, although there's nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man, he's talking in the third person, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I'll not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Let's stop right there. So Paul now is speaking of revelation, of miracle, of deliverance, of what God has been doing in his life. We're going to know in, in, in one more verse that the man he's just speaking of is himself. Okay? So he's saying, I, I don't know if I died and went to heaven or had a vision of heaven, you know, like John would have later. He says, I, I don't know, but I heard things, I saw things, I witnessed things that I wasn't permitted to talk about. He's addressing the Corinthians. He's saying, you're asking if I have the authority of God to do these things. I want you to understand the kind of revelation of God that he gives into my heart and gives into my life. But he's very, very careful here. He's almost tediously careful. Not to slip into that line of vanity. Because you see, there's a very fine line between godly passion and selfish ambition. There's a very fine line between false humility and true humility. There's a very fine line. In fact, false humility and arrogant braggadociousness are two sides of the same coin. The coin of self. And so Paul is almost tiptoeing here. Because there's a part of him that wants to probably say, who do you think you are? But then there's another part of him that knows, well, who do I think I am? I'm just a man. 
So whatever God has allowed in my heart and whatever God has allowed in my life is by God's grace and God's favor. But he's he's going through this, not a diatribe, but he's going through this conversation with the Corinthians because he's trying to teach them something about the importance of humility. Because the great sin of the Corinthian church was their lack of humility. The great sin of all of us is our lack of humility. And so he goes to verse seven and he says, to keep me, to keep me, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. So now we know the first six verses are revelations he experienced. These surpassingly great revelations. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Ouch. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. How important is brokenness to God? How important is weakness to God? I'll say it again. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Oh, beloved, how often do we take personal credit for the gifting or the anointing that God has placed upon our lives? How often do we take personal credit? And you say, well, I don't take personal credit at all. Are you personally humiliated when you fail? Then you're owning it. And it's not yours to own. To keep me from becoming conceited. There was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Everybody say this with me. He was gifted with torment. That doesn't set well with us. But that's what he said. Three times I pleaded with the Lord. Take this from me. Three times I begged God. Now here's the key to Paul's life, by the way. It was also the key to David's life. It's the key to everyone's life, no matter what, how big a knucklehead you might be or I might be. The key to Paul's life was when torment came, he didn't think God had abandoned him. When trial came, he didn't run from it. When trial came, he didn't put God on trial. When tribulation came, he didn't say, oh, God has failed and God is this and God is that. That's the mark of our immaturity. Paul knew that God was God and God was good. And so when trial came, when torment came, even when it was by the hand of the enemy, he knew that there could be no attack of darkness that God had not had an awareness of. So he went to to God immediately. Three times I pleaded with the Lord, take it from me. I'm telling you, church, don't play the lotto, but if you played the lotto and won, how many of you would be happy about that? 
I want hands. Okay. All right. Now, all right. All right. All right. All right. And you would shout to the Lord, glory to God. Pay your tithe. <laughs> glory to God. You would give him praise and honor and glory. But you know what? By Tuesday, you'd start forgetting about him. That's human nature. By Thursday, you will have still given him gifts and given some offerings. And, but all of a sudden, there would be this kind of, you know, little change that starts taking place. Because as much as we give praise for the good times, as much as we give thanks for the good times, as much as we celebrate the blessings of God when we come into the house of God, there is nothing like trial, tribulation, or demonic assault to drive us to prayer. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. I know from experience my most intense times of prayer have not been when life was good. My most intense times of prayer have been when life was difficult. My most intense times of prayer have been when trials were knocking at my door. The intensity and the fervor of me pleading with the Lord was when I had no other option and I had no other choice and I had no other way to go and I had no other answer on the, on the horizon and all I was reduced to was Jesus. I was falling on the rock. Acts 9, Saul was crushed by the rock. 2 Corinthians 12, Paul is falling on the rock and being broken. You say, well, why? Well, let's see why. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Verse 9, but he said to me, my grace, my grace, my grace, hallelujah, my grace, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness. I delight in weakness. I delight in weakness. I delight in weakness. I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This swims against the stream of my flesh. This swims against the stream of my mind. This seems contrarian to my personal sense of dignity. But it is the awareness that as we humble ourselves under the hand of mighty God, He lifts us up. Paul had learned the great secret that humility is essential, that suffering can be redemptive, and that the power of Christ was not given to visit you, but to rest upon you. We don't just need the Lord's anointing for church service. We don't just need the Lord's anointing when we're going into a particular season of battle that we're aware of. We don't just need the Lord's anointing when we understand what's on the horizon. We especially need the Lord's anointing when we don't understand what's on the horizon. In fact, I would make the argument that John Wimber made, which was the clearer the revelation, the clearer the mission, the clearer the sense of what God wants, the more difficult the task will be. 
that God in his grace will often give enormous favor of revelation when the task itself will be particularly difficult. Just as he told Ananias in Acts 9, I'm going to show Saul how much he must suffer for me. And Saul was shown, and Saul did suffer, and he was in persecution. He was in jail. He was beaten. He was on the run. He was in hardship. He was all of these different things. And you could almost imply from this particular text that the thorn in his flesh were the weaknesses, the insults, the hardships, the persecutions, the difficulties. Of course, from other letters, you might imply it was eyesight. It might have been a physical ailment. That's irrelevant to me. What's relevant to me is that Paul understood the redemptive nature of suffering in Christ. That God can use the difficulty of the day. That God can use the difficulty of the moment. That God can use the difficulty of the hour to bring about something in you that would not otherwise be displayed. And it is his beauty. It is his grace. It is his honor. It is his magnificence. How many of us want to walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit? The path is kind of clear. You must fall on the rock. You must allow the rock to break you. You must allow that brokenness to push to push you to the Christ who is the rock. And you must allow his strength to be your strength, his honor to be your honor, his glory to be the glory you seek, his beauty to be the beauty you behold. It's not for my name. And as wonderful a servant of the Lord as Dr. Patton was, it's not for her name. It's not for Dr. Monster's name. It's not for any of our names. It must be for the name and the sake of Jesus. And to get me out of the way is a challenge. To get us out of the way is a challenge. But his grace is sufficient. One of my favorite poems says, I walked a mile with pleasure. And she chatted all the way. Leaving me none the wiser with all she had to say. Then I walked a mile with sorrow. Never a word, said she. But oh, the things I learned from her. When sorrow walked with me. In our instant gratification culture. In our drive through throw away, disposable world. In our Americanism. And I'm not making a criticism of anything political. I'm just talking about our culture. In our Americanism where the pursuit of pleasure and happiness. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's in our founding documents. Where the pursuit of happiness is worshipped. I'm going to say that again. In our throwaway society, in our instant gratification culture, in which the pursuit of happiness is worshipped. The church must call that for what it is, idolatry. And we can't change the culture until we change ourselves. And when I've come to God to make this book my personal pursuit of happiness, 
then I'm disappointed when he doesn't answer my prayer the way I think he should. Then I'm angry when I walk through a trial or difficulty that I shouldn't have to walk through because, because I worship the pursuit of happiness. Therefore, why would God allow anything in my life that doesn't make me happy? It's a grotesque misappropriation of what happiness is. The chief end of man is to glorify God, the Presbyterian Catechism said, the old Westminster Catechism. The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Where is happiness found? It is found in the presence of Jesus. Where is joy found? It is found in the presence of Jesus. Where is peace found? It is found in the presence of Jesus. Where is purpose found? It's found in the presence of Jesus. Where is honor found? It's found in the presence of Jesus. Where must the church go again? To the presence of Jesus. Let me conclude by saying this. I've been outlining for you things that are missional of nature. I've been sharing with you about education and what the Lord's called us to do with this. I've been sharing with you about arts and what the Lord's calling us to do with this. I've been sharing with you about our campus and what the Lord's calling us to do with this. And various other things, and I'll share more next Sunday, God willing. But I'm under profound conviction today. And that conviction is that the Lord has given to us pretty clear revelation. And it sort of scares me. Because I know the battle is pretty big. And I'm under conviction because I haven't the strength to do what's necessary. We haven't the resources to do what's necessary. Both resources of personnel and of finances. And yet, I know God is able. But we're coming to a point in our journey in which we just can't get by. We need the Lord. We need the Lord. You know, there's something about signs and wonders that is really scary. Because for people, it is, it is often, you know, the, the entertain me mindset. I want to go and I want to see signs and wonders at church. I want to see this or that at church. Or I want God to do what he did and all of those things. And don't, don't get me wrong here. I'm not diminishing that. But my son and I had a conversation about some things that are taking place within the body of Christ right now. And, and some of them are, are interesting. Let's put it that way. They're just Interesting. And he was telling me about this event and that event and this manifestation and that manifestation. And then he, and then he told me about one, and I won't publicly say it today because I don't want anybody thinking I'm, I'm questioning another, another servant's work. That's not my business. But I just said to my son, because he's my son and also he's a minister, and, 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 and so I, I said to him as my son, but I also said to him kind of as an elder in the Lord. I said, well, you know what? Josh, I said, that's either God or it's fraud. There's no in-between on that. It's either the Lord or it's fraud. See, you can come into church and the music can move you and, and, and you can say, well, the, the Lord was there and that's great. But, but, but you know, there, it's, not, it's not an either or. It's like, well, yeah, somebody else might be moved and it's the music touched them. Or, 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 or a memory touched them, or any, any of these other things. There's a lot that, that happens in church life because we're dealing with psychology and sociology and history and everything else. That, you know, that, that, that you, you want everything to be from the Lord and of the Lord. But the fact of the matter is there's a lot of area in which, well, that was neat because the pastor entertained me. Or that was good because weren't the kids lovely. And that was good because I really appreciated that particular song because that particular song stirred a memory memory in my heart or this particular you know so there are a whole lot of things but then there comes down to where it's either God or it's fraud it's either the Lord is doing this or someone's lying 
And I think we're coming to a season in the body of Christ in the United States where we need God. We need real signs and wonders. We need a real anointing of the Holy Ghost. Not just so you can go, boy, that was a nice church service, but where the sick are healed, where the deaf hear, the blind see, the lame walk. And it's not just degrees of goodness. It's not degrees of human nobility. I guess what I'm trying to say to you, my friends, is that we really, truly need the Lord. We need him more than we ever have. Now, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm not the dullest either. At least I hope I'm not. Maybe I am. And the Lord uses the gifts he's given to me. He uses the gifts he's given to you. He uses the gifts he's given to our staff and everybody. But I am so hungry. I am so hungry hunger for the sufficiency of his grace. That our children would not only see a move of God, but that that move of God would be sustained. That the power of Christ may rest on me. Now, I've gone a long way today. To set a table. Let me go back to the beginning of today's message. You and I have choices every day. We can fall on the rock and allow that rock to break us of our pride, of our idolatry, of our worship, of the pursuit of happiness, and all these things. But the Lord loves us too much to just leave us. He will crush areas of my life in love, in mercy, in grace so he can raise them into the new man or the new woman that he's intended for our lives. He loves you too much to leave you where you are. You say, Pastor, you don't know the brokenness I've experienced. I don't. But I do know that his grace is sufficient for that brokenness. You don't know the crushing I've experienced, and I don't. But I do know that his grace is sufficient for that crushing. I don't know what torment comes your way. But I do know that it's not forever. And harvests are always a season away. And that seasons come and seasons go. And this torment you feel and this torment you experience isn't forever. But let the difficult season do its work. Let the sufficiency of grace fill your heart. Let the beauty of his presence. Again, we'll talk about this passage again, but I want you to, I want, a little, I want to give you a little preview here. Paul pursued Christ passionately. Christ answered in the middle of the sorrow. He answered. He didn't change anything. That's the testimony we usually like. The Lord changed it all. No, 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 no. He didn't change anything. But he answered. And he stepped into it. And he said, I'm here. 
Hallelujah. You're not going through this by yourself. I'm here. Hallelujah. I'm here and my grace, you're yoked to me. It's my grace that's sufficient. It's my strength that's perfected. It's my glory that's demonstrated. It's my power that's resting. I'm here. We'll walk through this. And you'll get to the other side of this. You that have suffered physically, you know what I'm talking about. You that have suffered in relationship battles, you know what I'm talking about. You know that have suffered in moments where the enemy has come in and is seemingly thinking he can set up camp. I'm wanting you to know today, the Lord is saying to you, I am here. I am here. Far too often we think the evidence of the Lord's presence is the deliverance from the problem. The evidence of the Lord's presence is the grace that is sufficient in the middle of the problem. Deliverance will come. It will come. But it may not come the way you and I want. Because the Lord wants to remove some idols from our lives. Stand with me.